The gravity of the time is such that every new avenue of peace, no matter how dimly discernible, should be explored. Never before in history has so much hope for so many people been gathered together in a single organization. You will provide a great share of the wisdom, of the courage, and the faith which can bring to this world lasting peace for all nations and happiness and well-being for all men. Hello to the Titans of Nuclear podcast listeners. My name is Suzanne Javaroski. I'm the chairman of the International Framework for Nuclear Energy Cooperation, also known as IFNEC. This is the IFNEC mini-series on the Titans of Nuclear podcast, and we want to thank Brett Kugelmass and his staff for inviting us to present this mini-series that tells the stories of how nuclear energy is providing clean, reliable energy all around the world. Thanks so much for joining us. I hope you enjoy this special IFNEC mini-series. For more information about what's happening at IFNEC, please visit us at ifnec.org. Thank you, and enjoy the podcast. We are here today on Titans of Nucle Nuclear with Vladimir Artashuk, the advisor to the Director General of the State Atomic Energy Corporation, Rose Adam. Thank you so much for joining us today. Mm -hmm. So we'd like to begin um, this episode by learning a little bit about you, please. We'd love to hear your history, how you came into the nuclear space. Oh, uh, that, is, that, is, that is not easy, not easy, not easy to explain, but I will try anyway. So look, in uh, the former Soviet Union, as you might know, uh, there were two technologies, and still have been two technologies, which make the vision of the general image of the Russian. That is space technology and nuclear technology. Yes. You, you know, United States, Russia, France, China, and UK, they're the five nuclear possessing countries, important yes. countries. So. And uh, I was born in the region, was grown in the region where the first nuclear power plant was uh, put into operation in 1954. Oh. So not many people outside of Russia know that the first in the world nuclear power plant was connected to the grid in Russia. It was wow. not commercial, by the way, yes. It was not commercial, it was kind of symbol, atom for peace. So it was and, 1954. And and what type of reactor was this? Uh, that reactor was a graphite moderated and water-cooled reactor. That's not pressurized water reactors which are dominating now. I yes. very much appreciate the contribution of other countries like United Kingdom, where the first commercial nuclear power plant was uh, constructed. And of course the United States, the pressurized water reactors uh, designed by the team of Admiral Recovery, so we appreciate that. But first in the world, connected to the grid, was in the region where I was grown. Okay. You see, that is near Moscow, 100 kilometers. So during my childhood, so we were excited about this kind of event. So that kind of symbol of the 20th century, uh, curbing the nuclear power. So many, 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 many young, uh, people dreamed of getting to be involved in this process. That was first reason. So that is romantic of the science mm -hmm. and new technology. But there were another reason uh, in uh, the Soviet Union and in Russia, those people who worked for nuclear industry, they were much more paid. <laughs> <You see? laughs> that's, uh, that's like everywhere. If you needed to some breakthrough, you need to motivate people. So combination of two events made myself to go to the university, uh, which was located at the same place where the nuclear power plant was put into operation. So I <clears throat> was happy to get knowledge from the people who started nuclear power in Russia. Yes. So it made another impact that made me, after the graduation of the university, to continue uh, my uh, career in nuclear sector. That's in brief, just in brief. 
And after your education, what are some of the first types of <clears throat> jobs that you could have in this space? <clears throat> Is it a more academic? Is it working on actual reactors? Is it studying some property of materials? <clears throat> what do you do next? Oh, I see. Uh, I continued my education as a PhD student, but there were big difference between PhD student in the Western countries and in the, the former Soviet Union. It was a different situation. In the United States and the Western world, the PhD, it is, uh, they are students. They just continue their next education. In the Russian universities, PhD course people, they were kind of staff members. Mm. You see? So that is, if you get, uh, if you're getting the uh, track to the PhD, with a very high probability, you will continue on the track of professor. Ah, okay. Yeah. So I was select, I was selected. In fact, it was not just you um, entering the course, or not you are just paying the training fee, not just uh, passing through exams. First, you have to be selected by the staff members. And you know, it was 1980 when I entered the university. Uh, I graduated in 1986. And uh, uh, from total number of uh, graduates, about 200, only three persons were selected to get into the PhD track. I was wow. one of them, yes. Very prestigious. I was one of them. Yeah. Yes, in the Soviet Union and still in Russia, to continue education in nuclear, in nuclear sector, that is prestigious still. And let me ask you, what do you think it was that made you excel? Was it motivation? Was it intelligence? Was it uh, just an intuitive understanding of the physics? What was it that, that set you apart? <clears throat> First of all, I think that is kind of uh, intuitively Percepted mission, mission, mission in this life. Mission in, in this life in young people is formed not, not from internally, but from the environment. As I mentioned, uh, I was grown in the region where the first and the world nuclear power was put into operation. It was a small city, by the way, 100,000 population, not more. But there were 12 research institutions in that city. All of them devoted to nuclear. And one of them is still is very, very famous Institute of Physics and Power Engineering. That is the heart of Russian fast breeder reactor program. So generation four reactors, fast breeder reactors. So this kind of environment of fast breeder reactors, they can, uh, can make nuclear power uh, um, make for nuclear power resources based ultimately, uh, unlimitedly. So that was first environment. So that is mission for nuclear power to bring to a new step of human development through new technology, not just nuclear technology, but fast reactor technology. This kind of people uh, were surrounding me. I got l knowledge from that kind of people. They were my professors. So that was maybe environment made me to, to continue my uh, career as a nuclear specialist, first academic, of course. Very good. And then what, after, what happened after your PhD? Uh, first, uh, by the way, I have three PhD, in fact. All of them <laughs> in nuclear. Yes, yes, over, that is a special okay, so, story. So overachiever. <laughs> Okay, let, let me give you that is special story also, not, not, not how to say, not regular case, just not a simple case. When I uh, finished my PhD in Russian, uh, yes, it was all, uh, yes, it was already Russian Federation, uh, not Soviet Union. I graduated 1990. Uh, 90. I got my first PhD in the former Soviet Union. And after that, I got a job as a staff, regular staff, assistant professor. In the two years, by the way, uh, Soviet Union collapsed, situation was changed. Uh, I, I cannot say it got more easy to leave. It was transient period. 
but it was a kind of new phenomenon, so it was uh, opened the doors to Russian scientists more um, to, 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 to other countries to go. Yes, it's more easy, more easily. So I uh, passed through the competition to get a scientific visa to Japan. Japan, yes, and uh, so I got this competition, I got a scholarship uh, through, from Japanese government and uh, went to Tokyo Institute of Technology first as an exchange scholar and after several months Japanese people just offered me an opportunity to enter PhD course in Tokyo Institute of Technology. Mm. And that time, and that time, by the way, that time, Japan uh, was looking for fast breed reactor development. Mm. And since Russia, and especially my city, was uh, famous in this, uh, in this area, they wanted to make kind of links for cooperation. So I entered the PhD course in Tokyo Institute of Technology, successfully finished that, because you, you know that is compared to Japanese PhD students, I had already background and experience with PhD. So after getting my PhD in Japan, they offered me a job in Tokyo Institute of Technology. And my last position in Tokyo was a associate professor of Tokyo Institute of Technology. And I was engaged in teaching international course students. How long were you, so you left the country, uh, uh, how long were you gone for? Uh, so I lived in Japan in total 10 years. Wow. Yes, 10 years. So had and, part, part of my heart, Japanese. <laughs> and, you, and you left just as things were really changing as well. When you came back, did you notice a, a very big difference in your country? Of course, of course, everything. So when I first uh, stepped into Japanese soil, it was, uh, how to say, it was a shock. Of course, it was a shock. Shock, cultural shock, cultural shock. Everything was different. Yes. Everything, food, environment, uh, appearance of the people, everything was uh, quite, quite, quite exotic and strange to me. What was familiar to me, it was uh, Japanese attitude to science. Mm. Yes, Japanese people, they are hardworking people. Yeah. And uh, yes, uh, they are hardworking e in everything. But my experience in Russia was just hard working in science. So this, <laughs> you see, these attitudes were quite similar to each other. So I, very, very quickly, I got accommodated to Japanese way of life, and I, in fact, I was happy to to to, to pass through this, uh, the, my pages of my life. And what about when you came back? What were things like then? Uh, uh, before coming to, 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 to Russia, um, uh, I defended my number three PhD. It was in Russia, but it was before my coming to uh, Russia to work. Japanese people appreciated academic uh, hierarchy uh, in Russia. This is quite also different and still different from Western world. So we, ha we have a level of PhD, but we have also level of so-called doctor habilitate. It's typical to Europe, but in Russia we have to pass through special committee. So to special committee, many professors listening to your presentation estimate your contribution to science, and after that they're voting. And mm -hmm. that was clo close voting, you see? <laughs> not, uh, not openly. So it was quite... Um, very, very severe situation to pass through. So I got my, this kind of step, I got when I was associate professor of Tokyo Institute of Technology, I defended a full doctor degree in nuclear engineering in Russian Federation. And Japanese appreciated that. And only after that, by the way, I got promotion in Japan. <laughs> 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 what? I was lucky. After your third PhD, what was your area of specialty? What were you the best in the world mm. at? Mm. My first PhD was uh, devoted to very exotic uh, phenomenon, muon-catalyzed fusion. 
muon catalyst fusion. It is kind of fusion, but uh, catalyzed by a special particle, muon, muon. So that is fusion, but not at the very high temperatures like in tokamak. So, but the same phenomenon, the same neutrons coming out from the fusion. And my work uh, was theoretical to estimate how much this phenomenon might be used to produce uh, secondary nuclear fuel like plutonium and uranium-233. Yes. So, so that was devoted mainly to produce uh, fuel for nuclear power. My second PhD in Japan was devoted to transmutation of nuclear waste. Mm. Yes, you know, for Japan, small country, not so much uh, areas to, to, to organize a deep geological repository. So for them in 1990s, it was very important to advertise uh, transmutation as a solution uh, of the waste problem. So I was lucky to, to be with those people in Japan to solve this uh, uh, issue for Japan where it is a very hot issue. And uh, my last uh, scientific uh, area was devoted to, to plutonium protection. You know, plutonium has a little bit bad image because of uh, possibility to use in nuclear uh, weapon programs. Yes. But scientists were always concentrated on how to make this plutonium unusable for uh, potential uh, terrorists or so. And, uh, and, I made and what, this one. what are the strategies there? To me, what, you know, when I first learned about um, the various isotopes of plutonium, to uh, me it seemed obvious that to make plutonium-239 unusable, all you would have to do is add a bunch of plutonium-240 to it. Is that not the exactly? Not, no, <laughs> that is yeah, not exactly like that. It's typical way. It's rather typical way to increase the um, uh, fraction of uh, uh, plutonium two forty, yeah. and this is done in uh, ordinary uh, plut uh, ordinary reactors. By the right. way, plutonium right. from reactors rather difficult to make um, effective uh, explosive device, but our idea. And uh, we developed this kind of study and research jointly with my Japanese professor and with the professor from Germany. His name is Professor Günther Kessler. He is rather, uh, not rather young right now, <laughs> yes. <laughs> but he was one of the chief leaders in Germany in fast reactor program. And at the late uh, years of his career, he was focused on how to make plutonium unusable through increasing fraction of plutonium-238. 238? Two, yes. So how, and how would you get to 238? What would be oh. the... Yeah, yeah look, look, plutonium-238. That is, this isotope is uh, produced in nuclear sector. Yeah. <clears throat> for hot pacers, you know. Ah, hot yes. pacers. Because so this, this, it's, a, it's like yes. a battery. Yes, kind of battery, exactly. Yeah. And this isotope is also produced to, uh, to, 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 <clears throat> to produce electricity for space missions also. Yeah. So this isotope is first available, and second is uh, industrially matured. Mm. So no problem with that at all. The problem is how to produce this plutonium in significant quantities. Right. Yes. And and, and, uh, and, and where does the what where does the PU two thirty eight come from? Are you adding neutrons from uranium two uh, two thirty five or or how do you get or or do you decay from uh, uranium two thirty eight in some way? How, how do you get to two? Okay. 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 Uh, for hard pacers, plutonium-238 is produced by neutron capture in neptunium-237. Neptunium. And where does neptunium come from? Neptunium is coming through the neutron uh, capture, uranium-235, uranium-236. So yes, okay. yes, yes, yes. I see, I see. And neptunium is considered as a 
kind of wastes because it's very difficult to, to make it effectively efficient in the ordinary light water reactors. And by the way, uh, plutonium-238 is also produced from curium. Mm. Yes, curium alpha decay to plutonium-238. Curium-242. So, you know, that is both Neptunium and Curium are considered as uh, so-called mine rectinides. Yes. In some countries, they are belong to category of high-level wastes. You but see? In, in order to strategically add neutrons to your minor actinides, do you have to go through a process of separation first? Do you have to do a processing on your spent fuel, separate out your constituent actinides and then bombard them with neutrons? There are several options. It is, uh, how to say, that is a point for optimization. There are some ways. <clears throat> but I, uh, I, I would like to be honest with you. This kind of study is, uh, belongs to academical area. I see, it's so too far. Right. Yes, you, you understand. That is too far from real situation, from the real technology. But, you know, first... Uh, I, and I was happy uh, with Japan and with Russia also because I belonged, I belonged that time to university academia, to university science. And university science is kind of strategic science. It looks for further distance. Yeah. And we have to, that, that was our mission. That was our job, by the way. So we were, we ha had to make some kind of orientation for uh, science and technology, and I was happy to, you see, to to to, to touch with uh, transmutation of nuclear wastes and with the plutonium protection. So we showed, generally, that nuclear power has a potential first to be wasteless to transmute uh, nuclear waste and to be protected in terms of plutonium. And can I? Can I challenge the premise on nuclear waste with you, just to hear what you say about this? It, the, the no, fact just that it's that it's that it's dangerous at all, given how low quantities it's created to, created to begin with, and how easy it is to protect it and to store it. It seems to me that we've gone too far <clears throat> in trying to go that extra. You know, we, we've got it's already ninety nine. You know, percent in terms of like in terms of the perfect waste stream, right? It's there's so much less waste of nuclear waste than every other power generation source, and it seems like we put in so much extra effort to eliminate it when it's so minor uh, an Earth problem to begin with. <clears throat> that is uh, how to say this viewpoint is quite uh, substantial. So definitely, that is a United States approach. You see the Yucca Mountain, just put spent nuclear fuel and forget for some. <laughs> but you see, we in Russia are developing a different story. Yeah. So you, yeah. we are developing. Well, I, we, that I is our way. Uh, personally, I think Yucca Mountain is even too much work. To me, it seems like you could just find a hole in the ground where water doesn't move through and just put it all in the hole, put 10 feet of dirt over it, and you're done. But look, uh, the problem is longevity of the yeah. situation. So isotopes, some of the isotopes, they have a uh, half-life, 100,000 years, so even yeah. a million years. So we have to, uh, to first, to, to show to public, to general public, the possibility to isolate waste for so long period. So all, always public will be a little bit cautious about these kind of things. So, and, and we have to analyze models, uh, offer the models to, to make a good prediction power for the people. And, but how come we don't take years. the same attitude to carbon-14 or to potassium-40? These also last for hundreds of thousands of years and they're in our bodies, but we don't say that we have to pull out every carbon-14 atom out of our body and put it in a repository somewhere. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> first of all, first of all, they are not so uh, concentrated, you see, and they are part of our ah, planet. Ah, that's a solution that we have to just dilute it, <laughs> just, di just mix it in with everything else. <laughs> no, but technologically, technologically, it's unfeasible, of course, yeah. of course, unfeasible. Yeah. Okay, good. Um, I'm glad we got to talk about that a little bit. Um, tell me, so after your uh, your studies, you know what. What have you pursued then? You know, uh, now that you are the you're the expert. You know, you grew up learning from all the experts, but ah. now everyone is learning mm. from you. So, what what do you teach them? <clears throat> so you, um, yeah, you have put a very serious question uh, to me because when I came back to to Russia from Japan, my uh, expertise, uh, no, I I would say. Uh, lost some impetus. Mm. You see, it's sometimes, not sometimes, but that is a regular practice. At certain age, you have to move from expertise to management. Mm. So when I, when I came from Japan, you see, I came to Russia, which got rather different from Russia, from which I moved to Japan. Yeah. You see, much more open, Yes, Russia started to play globally, also with the cooperation with many countries in several uh, several sectors of economics. So one of them nuclear power. So Russia got more open to the people, to cooperation, to the world. So my country at that time needed those people who got uh, international experience to organize these kind of links. So that's why I moved to management. And my first position when I came back from uh, Japan was a vice rector of uh, university responsible for international cooperation. Wow. So, yes, yeah, so I started to be like manager. <laughs> so part time I was a professor, but time I was a manager. But so, international and, cooperation, that means you got to meet people from around the world and help them understand what was happening in your country and help understand what was happening in other countries. I mean, that's very important. Yes, of course. That's, that's the point. Yes. What were some of the things that you learned or some of the challenges that you encountered in that role that were obviously different than your academic studies, but still challenging to you? Um, of course. So, uh, answer which is coming from my heart is uh, what I learned, that is the difference of the cultures. Yeah. But uh, first I learned that in Japan, you know. Yes. First I learned about that in Japan. That's why you're and perfect for the role. <laughs> <laughs> you see, in Japan, uh, my professor, my professor, by the way, he was one of the leaders of the Fast Reactor program in, in Japan. Mm. When he looked at me first, he told to his uh, Japanese colleagues, oh, that guy could not survive in Japan. <laughs> you see? Let's make him to get his PhD in two years instead of three. You see? The, that guy could not survive in Japan. After several years, they talked to me much more uh, sincerely, and they explained that my appearance was for them confusing. They used to get Russian people as a just bear, aggressive, a bit noisy, like that, you see? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> that yeah. is general image. Yeah. But my appearance, so I can, uh, I can demonstrate to you my um, uh, height, height. So I'm not so high, I'm not so big one, you see that? <laughs> <laughs> and they, they linked mass of the body, with energy, Japanese people linked my mass of the body, that's how to say, to say it simply, with my energy, and they thought, oh, not so much energy, that guy could not survive in Japan. Wow. I survived in Japan 10 years. Wow. And the reason is because I learned, first of all, in Japan myself, I try to identify what am I in this world? Yeah. What does it mean Russia for this planet? What does it mean Japanese culture to me? 
So a main, uh, my, my main conclusion, what is the strength of the spirit? And one of the best records in Japan, when uh, at a farewell party, Japanese students, they had a tradition like in football team, they made some signature and wishes on the football uh, cloth. Yeah. And one of, uh, one of the Japanese students uh, wrote, uh, Vladimir Sensei, I thank you very much for samurai spirit I learned from you. Wow. You see? What that was honor. my... Yes, it, 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 it has been my honor from Japanese people to get this kind of message. Thank you for samurai spirit. So, <clears throat> as, uh, as uh, we would like to put it seriously, the most important thing, we have to understand each other. Yes. Each other. And to make this kind of understanding through just the exchange of emails, it's impossible. We so have how to... do you do it? Yeah, so how do you do it? In Japan, how did I do? Or, how, no, how, I understand in Japan, that was really where you, you learned ah. how to do it. Now, in your, in, your, in your current role, or when you facilitate a new international cooperation, what is your strategy to understanding, to developing that understanding? My personal strategy, my personal strategy, my personal strategy. My personal strategy is, first of all, be sincere with people. Yeah. Uh, maybe you know Jawaharlal Nehru, one of the leaders of India, Jawaharlal Nehru, first prime minister of India. Ah, yes. He was, yes, he was educated in the UK. He, excellent education he got in the UK. And one of his books, he wrote, Discovery of India. His discovery of India. You mentioned, first of all, we have to understand who we are. Mm -hmm. What is our mission? So what mm -hmm. does it mean, Russian technology, to the world? And uh, the point is that Russia, through the their maybe religious religious features, uh, mental uh, environment, uh, maybe mainly religious. We are not so aggressive in advertising. Mm. We are not merchants. Mm. You see, we are not just uh, uh, do something and make an advertisement, we did a lot. So we are shy, in fact. Sometimes our behavior just to, to how to say, to hit to heed our shyness, you know? Yeah. And this is very deeply in our mentality, in our heart. In order to understand that, we have to make uh, communications. We have to meet, meet each other, to make more uh, frequent seminars, to, to understand that we are not going to cheat you. Yeah. Uh, uh, Russian people, their, their feature, maybe a characteristic, that is, we built very long-term relationships. Mm. We are not just get this shot in order to get profit. No, we making long-term, long-term. That is our maybe national strategy. And Japanese people, they do the same. Yeah. For them, if you just to get money for a short period without long-term strategy, that means nothing. That's why they have a lot of people, aged people in the management. By the way. Yes. And, okay, this makes a lot of sense to me now. Can you help tie this together uh, back to the commercial nuclear sector and how mm -hmm. Russia sees long-term relationship building um, as part of its nuclear export um, strategy? <clears throat> commercial. Uh, commercialization to my mind, that's just a phenomenon for uh, Russian expert. That is a recent phenomenon, by the way. Wow. A recent phenomenon. Yes. I didn't know that. Uh, yes. Uh, in the former Soviet Union, uh, Soviet Union built uh, several nuclear power plants in Eastern Europe. So that is uh, Eastern Germany, a Russian PWR type reactor, Hungary, uh, Czech. Slovakia, Bulgaria, Finland, uh, Finland, but from 
nowadays it's difficult to to say that was a commercial. Mm. You see, it's difficult to say. At that time, you know, that is what Soviet bloc countries. So, and uh, we just uh, survived in our own, uh, not a global economy. Yeah. And what was most important, commercialization or just not commercialization, just a political move or just friendly move, like difficult now to estimate. Commercialization came recently. Uh, so, you know, but also difficult to find it as a commercialization. To my mind, still that is kind of, uh, still kind of help to the outside world. Still, look, Russia is making construction in Bangladesh. Mm -hmm. Russia is making construction in Belarus. So, uh, in these kind of countries, we should badly need energy. Yeah, yeah. And they are not so rich countries. Yeah. And I was very much impressed when I visited Belarus. It was my first visit when I came back from uh, Japan to Russia. I visited Belarus and listened to a um, presentation of the president of Belarus uh, in front of students of the National University. And he mentioned, Look, if you think that we in Belarus construct nuclear power plant just to get an electricity, it is a mistake. Electricity we can get from Russian nuclear power plant, which is just 60 kilometers from border. Right. We would like to get nuclear power plant in Belarus because that is point to increase intellectual level of the nation. Ah, you see? Yes. yes. So that is the point. Nuclear power plant, that is just point for concentration of intellectual power of nation. That's why Russia not, 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 just, pre, uh, not just selling nuclear power plant. We provide many kinds of support, starting from uh, university education. Mm -hmm. You know that there are now in Russia, in, by the way, in my city where I was grown, there are about... 300 Vietnamese students, about the same number of the students from Turkish Republic. So and this is this study. is because they they want to bring nuclear technology back to their country. So they send their students to learn yes, about exactly. it, and then yes. they are yes. uh, equipped to develop yes. their own internal program. Yes, it's so, difficult to say that just commerce. That is a cooperation for yeah. the mutual benefits and for, for global benefits. Yeah. And so what else are you looking forward to in the space? You know, I'm sure you have a very different perspective than I do, just you know, based on your, you know, not only your life experience, but the part of the world that you're in right now. If you were to project out, you know, the next, you know, 10 years or so, what do you see exciting that's being developed now that will come to fruition then? Personally, I'm very much excited about introduction a new nuclear power technology. What does it mean new? You see, uh, till now, pressurized water reactor, that is just in heart. They have a very sophisticated phenomenon, nuclear fission. But electricity is produced by the technology with long history, you see, steam produces, rotates, turbine, and, and get electricity. That is 200 years, yes, at least. Yes. So nuclear power should make a new uh, step, much more effective step in developing. So high temperatures, like high temperature gas-cooled reactor, first. Second point, maybe uh, supercritical light water reactors. So again, so to use uh, gas turbines to, 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 to be more effective. So that is my expectation. And to produce hydrogen, to produce hydrogen in high temperature gas cooled reactors. Because uh, you see, we need uh, clean energy. Hydrogen is considered by everybody that is a clean energy. But to produce hydrogen as a clean energy sources through so-called unclean energy. That is yeah. a little bit tricky. Nuclear yes. power is a clean. Yeah. To use nuclear power to effectively produce hydrogen. So as a scientist, I'm looking uh, at this area very carefully. 
And how how do people think about clean energy? And uh, sometimes we call it the clean energy revolution, you know, because so many people are thinking about it and investing time and money into it. How do you think about that in Russia? Is is it a, is it the same cultural phenomenon of we must move towards clean energy, or is it just a an academic pursuit? No, that is not an academic pursuit. That is a real situation. So the climate change this is a global phenomenon, and science has clearly shown on the process behind the global warming. That is CO2. So that is scientifically justified phenomenon, CO2. So we need drastically to reduce emission. So we have a lot of resources. You know, Russia is a very big country. Gas, oil, coal, everything. Right. But right. We, we, de- we develop nuclear power. Yeah. We develop nuclear power. And that is not for just supporting other kind of maybe weapon uh, industry. That is not. That's separately. Yeah. We have a separate uh, this kind of sector. But we develop nuclear power with a great uh, impetus. So yes. that is our mission in the world. First, you remember, first nuclear power plant was put into a yes, in yes. the Soviet Union. <laughs> and still we continue this mission to show the people the way. And how, but how do you balance, and, and maybe this is beyond um, the scope of this conversation, but I'd, I'd love to hear it if you have thoughts on it. How does Russia balance um, that, the fact that fossil fuels are such a strong part of their economy, and they are such good producers of oil, of gas, um, and they have an industry that's also done amazing things bringing that technology um, you know, uh, to become very sophisticated. How do you balance that versus a transition to non-carbon emitting energy sources? If uh, just to translate official viewpoint, an yeah. official situation. So we still, in Russia, still being developing uh, the strategy to non-carbon future. Still it is under development, so it is not fixed. We have just draft. Yeah. So, but in this strategy, it's a real situation. So that is reduction of the uh, coal. It's uh, increasing the efficiency of energy use. So this nuclear power in, increase a bit. So, and gas, you know, in Russia, gas uh, in the energy sector is appreciable, rather appreciable fraction. Yeah. So compared to other countries, so <laughs> situation in Russia is uh, not bad to, yeah. to, to, to say like that. So we, uh, to, to put it uh, in short, so we understand the situation globally. We do our efforts and as an indicator and illustration of this effort, a Russian expert of nuclear technology to other countries. Yes. And one of the things that I'm very excited about that we haven't talked about yet are these ships. You guys have developed, and I think you're probably the world leaders in this, you have developed these ships that have small nuclear reactors on them that you can uh, <laughs> sail to another part of the world and, and plug into a port. I think this is incredible. Uh, why not make thousands of these and sell them all around the world and have every coastal city be powered off of nuclear ships? <clears throat> By nuclear ships, uh, ship, you mean icebreakers? No, th- I th- not just icebreakers, but there's, I believe, maybe in the last year or so, there was a like a 40 megawatt or an 80 megawatt ship that was used to power a, uh, a port city. I see, uh, I understand. Yeah. I understand. Now I understand. You have mentioned about so-called floating nuclear power plant. Yeah, floating nuclear power plant. Exactly. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, Yes, floating nuclear power plant. It is a very great achievement. It's not technologically breakthrough. It's not. It is based on... uh, React the technology applied for icebreakers. Yeah. So you know that is north north of Russia. They just north of Russia. Yeah. <laughs> and so in order to make navigation of uh, in this region feasible, uh, Russia, Soviet Union put into operation first icebreaker 
in late 1950s. Again, to show the people around the world that Russia, Soviet Union, really makes application of nuclear power for peaceful purposes. One of the symbols, icebreakers. Yeah. So we accumulated in uh, former Soviet Union experience, and now we have uh, several uh, nuclear icebreakers. And uh, <clears throat> this uh, currently we have a new series of uh, new generation of icebreakers. They, these icebreakers, based upon small modular reactors. Yes, and we produced already six of them. Uh, and this is a serial production. You see, that is serious, so cheaper. Yes. It's getting yeah. to be cheaper. Yeah. And two of them, two of them last November got criticality. So they are under testing uh, at icebreaker. So there, uh, the, this is a ma mature technology. <clears throat> and of course, for those countries, for that countries which uh, who doesn't need the ice breaking fleet application, that is just floating nuclear power plant. Yeah, yeah. and floating nuclear power plant was um, uh, put into commercial operation quite recently, just 22nd of May. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yes, that's recently. So Russia really consider floating nuclear power plants as a commercial product in near future. It seems really? genius to me. It seems genius. I think, wh why not make a thousand of them and just and, and make many ports and make it a, a giant ex It seems to me like it's the greatest export that a country could come up with because it's high value. It's easy to you know move. It's in an energy market. Everyone needs energy. Um, and you've perfected the technology. So why not make, uh, why not scale up production? Or maybe that's the idea. <clears throat> but we are on this track. Yeah. We are on you that are. track, okay. yes. really. There are some, of course, uh, problem around that, so not <clears throat> not uh, not ready uh, legislation how to move this kind of uh, floating nuclear power plant in, uh, through international areas uh, in the ocean. So discussion is ongoing, still ongoing at the level of International Atomic Energy Agency, but we are on that track floating nuclear power plants, one of the products. Very good, very good. Um, and then also, mm -hmm. since you guys are leaders in the fast uh, fast breeder technology as well, is there thoughts of commercializing <coughs> that also? Yes, <clears throat> uh, we are on the track. Because this technology, to be, <clears throat> to be feasible, needs to be competitive, <clears throat> at least within the nuclear power domain. So we are looking at that. We are doing like that. At least, at least, at least, we have a fast reactor, which is commercially operated since 1980. It is producing electricity commercially feasible. This is the BN 600 or. B BN six hundred exactly. Yes. exactly, and and you're but looking to, make, to develop the BN eight hundred or something. <coughs> eight hundred. <coughs> Three years ago, it was put into operation, yeah. just to, to demonstrate to the people that we still <coughs> possess competencies. You still got it, see, as we say. Got it. Still got it. Competence. Still got it. <laughs> okay. <coughs> well, this has been an amazing conversation. So maybe Vladimir, as we wrap up. Can you just end on a note of why nuclear is important to you? Why it's important to the world? I believe that uh, nuclear power is a gift from the God to people to provide for them opportunity to reach sustainable development. Clean, clean, <clears throat> a lot of resources, potential to transmute nuclear wastes, potential to produce fuel, plutonium or uranium-233. So everything in one point. Great potential. So I'm happy to belong to this industry and will continue to work for the for the global nuclear industry. That's why I'm happy to be a member of uh, to be a member of uh, IFNEC. <laughs> Amazing.
very energetic organization. Vladimir Artuzik, thank you so much for your time. It's been an honor <clears throat> to talk to you today. <clears throat> thank you. Oh. And initiate at least a new approach to the many difficult problems that must be solved in both private and public conversations. If the world is to take off the inertia imposed by fear and is to make positive progress toward peace.